Well, let's take a look at Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a puzzle-filled mystery game uh, from the op. Before we start our investigation, I do have to thank the op for providing us with a review copy of this game. So to start off, I want to make sure everyone knows what game I'm talking about here. Here I'm talking about Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a puzzle game for one or more players. I'm not talking about Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion, which is a Scooby-Doo themed version of Betrayal at House on the Hill. Unfortunately, both of these games came out pretty much at the same time. Like I even think within weeks of each other and they feature very similar names. And this has caused confusion for a number of gamers, myself included. Yeah, the escape and betrayal are of course the keywords to look for, but it can be hard to pick those out sometimes, especially if you're in a rush and you got a lot of media coming at you. So Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion was designed by Jay Cormier, Sen Foon Lim, and Kemi Mandel. It features cartoony artwork by Rob Lundy and Rick Hutchinson. Uh, this is an escape room in a box style game that can be played with one or more players. Now, playtime is listed as an hour or two on Board Game Geek. I will note, nowhere on the box does it list this. So that's been submitted by someone on Board Game Geek. I gotta say, it could be anywhere. It's really gonna depend on your group's problem-solving ability, but even more so their sense of exploration. This game is broken up into two chapters, which is kind of cool, and you can save between them. So you could play it all in one sitting, so it's it's you might fit it. I think you'd need a fairly long game night, but you can split it up into two. Right, and it's great to see some familiar and Canadian names there, hmm. as well as fellow podcasters. Now, similar to other puzzle games, like the Exit series of games reviewed in the past, this is a one-and-done game. This is a, you play it once and only once, and it's done with. There are envelopes that you're going to open during play. That said, nothing is actually destroyed while playing this game. Plus, the envelopes actually come with stickers that are fairly resealable, I've noticed. So it is possible when you finish this game to maybe pass it on to another group. Though all the envelopes will have been opened once, but you can shove the stuff back in. Actually, as you play, it tells you to put stuff back into the envelopes. Well, to get a pretty much spoiler-free look at what you get in the box for this game, check out our Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion unboxing video on YouTube. The only thing we show off is the first room where you start the game and the first clue card, which is unlocked very early in the game. Don't read off any of the text from the books, so you don't have to worry about anyone ruining the game in any way. As a bonus, everything blue is hidden. Yes, it is true. Which does some weird things with the windows in the first room. And we get to the shaggy, it looks really impressive because his background is gone. Now, in regards to the components, I do have a few things I do want to talk about here and highlight, even here on the podcast. And one of the things I like is the box. Uh, this is not your standard board game box. It's not the lid slides off the top, but rather a like, like a pizza box. You can flip open the front and it opens up. Um, most of what you get in the box are booklets. Now, these are thin. like I, I, They're floppy. They're floopy. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, there is one called the Mystery Manual, which is very quickly goes over the rules. Like, like I, lightning quick. This is the kind of thing where you don't have to prep ahead of time. You can crack this open with your friends you're going to play with that night and get through it quickly. And then there are five other books, one for each of the Mystery Ink team. Uh, there is a thin card standee for each character as well. No, very thin. Now, the rest of the contents are a stack of room cards, a deck of clue cards, and a number of sealed envelopes that you open during play. Now, don't do what I did. Don't throw the box insert out. There's a purple box insert in there, which I actually first thought was completely pointless, especially because, like I said, the floopy books were kind of flooping down inside it. Well, it may seem useless. It does actually help because what it lets you do is shut the lid properly, which I totally missed out on. No, actual pizza box makers have managed without it for years, so I'm not quite sure why it's required. Well, the thing is, pizza's round, right? So the pizza just goes round where square stuff isn't. And what happens is the decks of cards slide into the corners, the back corners, and when you try to close it, it catches on them. So you need everything in the middle to actually close it properly. And while that organizer had a nice gap on the sides and a spot, a trough in the middle. So there, there was a reason for it. I now know. Well, now that we have some idea of what you get, how do you use all these cards, books, and standees? Well, you start off the game, uh, a, a game of Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, by reading chapter 5,000 in Fred's book. 
Now, I don't want to spoil anything here. I am not going to tell you exactly what happens. What I do want to talk about is the Coded Chronicles system, because this is actually game one in a system, a series of games that are going to use the same mechanics. At any given point during the game, you're going to have one or more room tiles face up on the table. Each of those is going to have a number of features on it denoted by numbers. Um, most of these are three-digit numbers. Along with a revealed room, you're gonna, it's going to tell you how many characters are there. And you're going to have standees representing who's in the room. Now, each of the characters in the game are going to have a specialty. Now, for the Scooby-Doo version, Velma can research, Shaggy can eat things, Daphne can use things, Scooby can smell things, and Fred can investigate things. Now, to actually use a skill, each character standee also has a number on it. And what you do is you line up the, the number on the standee with what they want to use their skill with. And then what that does is it gives you a four digit number and you then look up that four digit number in the appropriate book. And everyone's book is numbered differently. I said, Fred, you look at 5,000. Well, all of Fred's entries are 5,000s. So player two or icon character two with location 403 means you read out section 2,430 from the book that has all the 2,000 sections. Yep. Pretty simple. Now, some features only have two digits on them. What that means is you need to find an object to interact with it. So if you have a door that just says 23 and you've got your four, well, 423 isn't enough numbers to actually look anything up. So you've got to find something. Objects like keys and whatever else all have one digit on them. Once you have a digit and a number, you combine them together. So you have the person, the object, and the feature it gives you a four-digit number. You look it up. What's really interesting and actually rather fan fascinating about this game that adds a lot to it is that all skills can be used with all features. So yes, you can have Shaggy try to eat the table in the first room. Well, they really had to put a lot of writing into this to fill out all the options from yes. the ridiculous to the required. Exactly. Uh, you should have been there, actually. Like, like I, I almost wish we had an actual play, except it would spoil it. Um, but when the kids figured out they could have Shaggy use his eat skill on the butler, I haven't heard that much giggling at my game table ever with my girls. Like I've heard them play another game, but like play in a board game together. And then even more so was when Big G sighed with relief, like, oh, when he didn't actually devour the butler. Instead, asked him where he could get some food and where the kitchen was. Like she literally thought in the game he was going to eat the butler somehow, which I thought was hilarious. Zoinks, Jeeves, where's the kitchen at? Yeah. So as you go through and do this, you've got your one room, your one character, whatever. As you do this, you're going to unlock new rooms and clue cards, which may have more features on them. And these will lead to some puzzles to be solved. And at various points during this story, you're going to be instructed to open a secret envelope. Now, this game comes with eight secret envelopes, all that have a mix of different things in them. So not only are the books nonlinear to keep things obscure, but you also have sealed aspects that you can't even get to to mess things up. Yep. Now, when trying to solve a puzzle, um, you do have the option to spend Scooby snacks for clues. These also are concern, consumed if you make a mistake. So you'll read a passage that says, like, uh, if you tried to eat the table, you got a splinter, spend a Scooby stack or something. Um, or entering the wrong coat to open a locked door, for example. Now, all of this leads to a final mystery that you're attempting to solve, as well as trying to escape from the haunted mansion. And what's fascinating here is that your final score, which is based on the number of Scooby snacks you do, is also based on whether you solve the mystery or not. So you can actually escape the Haunted Mansion but fail to solve the mystery, which I thought was an interesting choice. And Deanna and I were having a debate on whether or not in the Scooby-Doo show if they ever got it wrong. And I think there were episodes where they like pulled the hat off expecting it to be the butler and it was actually someone else. So I think that's actually a really good representation of the series. And I thought it was neat. Like it, you, can, you can get a perfect score and not spend a single Scooby stat, but still get the mystery wrong. And I like how there were both options. Like we solved it, Scoobs. 
So as for my final thoughts, um, I got to start by saying I was not a huge Scooby-Doo fan growing up at all. Um, it was definitely something I saw. It was on. From, from my memory of it, it was one of those things where like a good Saturday morning cartoon would come on and then there'd be Scooby-Doo and I'd sit through it for the better cartoon that was coming up next. I couldn't tell you the order of the stuff that went growing up, but that was it. Now, it wasn't really my jam. I totally get using this license for making family-friendly horror games, right? Um, games that are spooky instead of scary and therefore much more approachable for families. As an adult gamer with kids, I think it's awesome to see Scooby-Doo games. Yeah, well, I, I was a pretty big Scooby-Doo fan. I even got my kids into it at a pretty early age. I found the sheer content and volume of <laughs> Scooby content a bit overwhelming. I mean, it is a marketing mammoth, even without board games. Yeah. See, my kids know of it. They, they, they had a comic book or something, but they weren't huge fans. So to be honest, there's a good indication that you don't need to know Scooby to play this at all. There's nothing. You might get some of the inside jokes a bit more, and you might be wondering, why the heck does this dog talk? Or why does he talk so silly? But Because that is the one thing. My kids had a real hard time trying to figure out how to pronounce. Oh, that was one they just didn't know what to do with. They're like, what does that say? But that's just growing up with it. I had to actually grab a YouTube snippet so I could play it for him. So the problem with this marketing mammoth that is Scooby-Doo, of course, is the brand confusion that arose that I mentioned earlier. Like I first heard this is Scooby-Doo featuring a Betrayal of House on the Hill coming out. I mentioned on the show before, I am not a big Betrayal fan. So I was like, eh, I don't care. And then Gen Con Online, I happened to be watching a ton of panels and doing game demos while watching game demos. And I happened to see Escape from the Haunted Mansion on it. And I'm like, oh, cool. And I sat and watched it. And I'm like, huh, this is very different. Like there's room tiles like Betrayal House in the Hill, but they're being used in a different way. Like they're combining standees with character abilities with the environment. This is awesome. This is such a cool concept, which I now know is the whole Coded Chronicle system. But at the time I was like, wow, what a weird twist on, on Betrayal House in the Hill. So a few weeks later, I see my local game stores got in Betrayal at Mystery Manor. And I'm like, sweet, I'm going to have to get a copy. Like, despite being someone who consumes a ton of board game media and, and announcements, I missed completely that there were two different Scooby-Doo games released at the same time. And it wasn't until seeing this copy, at the, well, it wasn't, I didn't see it, the COVID was going on, and someone sent me pictures, Ian sent me some pics, and I'm like, that doesn't look like the game I saw. I, I had no clue. There were two different Scooby-Doo games out. And even today, I was on Board Game Geek, and I was in the rule forum for this game and i saw people asking questions about the betrayal game there was a question about when the betrayer comes out and i'm like well wrong game so there are currently more than 50 different scooby-doo branded games listed on bgg right now wow going all the way back to the 70s it is a crowded license yeah in the blog version of this review, I call it another one that was released the same week, but this one's for four plus. So you can tell, I'm not going to get those confused, but they did put out another one. Like it was just all of a sudden. So anyway, back to the game I actually saw the demo of and though I was all excited about is this one, Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. My fascination with the Coded Chronicle system from that review did not change. It didn't end. Like this is such a cool way to present a mystery and puzzle game. Like, I, I found this so much cooler than the code wheel with three digits to draw a card. Like, it's just so well done. I love the different combination of the character abilities and how each of them interacts with the various rooms and objects and how it all works. And what this gives you is an actual sense of exploration as you move around rooms to room and furniture and look at paintings and everything. Another aspect I liked was that not one player controls one character. Well, it does make sense to split the work by giving each character to a different player. There's no reason one player can't do all the reading. The game rules say one or more players, and it's legit. The problem with this, though, comes up th is that this is a cooperative game. And it is th a puzzle game like this, the alpha gamer can be a problem. Especially with everyone able to control everyone, a dominant player could easily take over the game and, and, and run it from the top of the table. Now, that is going to be dependent on your group. Like, you know, if you have an alpha gamer in your group that can handle playing Scooby-Doo with you and you probably know who that player is, you might want to avoid it and tell them, hey, you know what? When we're done, we'll give you our copy. And you can go through it yourself. I don't know. 
So and uh, and no bonus points for doing the voices. No, we we there is the other advantage of my kids not knowing the license. <laughs> I think in a way. Now there is another issue with if you do do the each player controls one character, and I don't want to give anything away why, but there are points in the game where not everyone's there. Uh, there the people come and go as the story evolves, and because of that, if you actually do assign like, hey, you play this person, well, what do they do if that character is not present? Right. And that's a pretty standard trope within the Scooby-Doo TV show. They split the party a lot in that show. Uh, they are not good role players. <laughs> so uh, so it's not surprising to see that uh, duplicated in the game yep. when it really does seem like they have tried very strongly to, to sort of replicate that feeling of the TV shows as mm -hmm. best they can. Now, one aspect of the game I really appreciated that wasn't obvious in the demo I watched is how clean the game is in a way. Because starting off, you quickly become almost overwhelmed with clues. Like the first couple rooms, it's just like you're putting cards and cards and cards out. And there are cards that at the end of it, like you don't need till way later. Like it's, it's not little compartments. It's not compartmentalized in any way for the puzzles. But when you do solve a puzzle, it'll have you put a bunch of the cards away, which I thought was really nice. So I kind of like the way the game cleaned up after itself as you played. Well, that's always a, a nice touch if you can be, uh, you know, when you're done the game, the cleanup's almost already done for yeah. you. As for the puzzles, um, we found them to be mostly just difficult enough. Like some you breeze through, like you see it, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's obvious. But others required some thought. Um, there was one that took us quite a bit of time and tempted us to look up a clue, but we did uh, figure it out before going that far. There is one issue um, where we actually got stuck, unfortunately, where there is a, during the chapter break, it tells you to confirm that you have everything you need to go forward and it missed an item. Now, this is something I think most groups wouldn't miss, but we did happen to miss it. And because it wasn't on the list of stuff you need for the next chapter, we didn't know we were missing it and actually hit a dead end, which kind of sucked. So we actually, I, I, that's why I was online on Board Game Geek looking the game up, was trying to figure out what we missed. And it ends up that we missed something in an earlier room. Again, it's probably, it's, I, I wouldn't think it easy to miss clues, so I'm not sure how we missed it, but we did miss it. And penalizing in the game, what should happen is we spend a Scooby stack. Like it's written that way. So here's what you should have to go forward. And if you're missing any of it, get it now and spend a Scooby snack for each one you missed. So game wise, it should just cost us a Scooby snack. Oh, we missed something very obvious, but because that item wasn't on the list, we didn't know that. So now we were able to continue because I figured out what we missed and we were able to get it and we just marked off a Scooby snack. So that was a little disappointing. Uh, one of the things to note though, because of this, this game took us way longer than the two hours that, that yeah, I expected to spend playing the game because we spent a lot of time stuck on this one puzzle. And that is going to be the thing that it's going to affect playtime for everyone. Because unlike the exit games, you're not on a timer. You're not rushing. Uh, like, except, well, maybe like our first night, the kid's bedtime. But what will happen is you're going to spend a variable amount of time on this, depending on how much you want to explore. And if you just rush through it, like, you know, that Scooby's not supposed to eat the, the, the it's, or whatever. Shaggy's not supposed to eat the butler. You know, that's not going to lead anywhere, but you can do it. And how much, especially with kids, they're going to want to do it. That's going to affect it. Yeah. It's one of those things where I think any, the only way you can put time frames on a game is if there are time based scoring, right? So yeah. if you've got like an escape room where if you finish it in 40 minutes, you get the gold or if you finish it in 60 minutes, you get silver or whatever, that sort of thing. Uh, you can put a time limit on it, but otherwise, and especially a family game like this, um, I, it, I don't know why they shouldn't be putting times on the boxes. And, well, they didn't. Uh, and no, they, they don't. Absolutely. And it, it's sad. It's kind of sad almost that they uh, threw them onto board game geek or someone's bought, someone's taking the time someone to throw it yeah. on there because it's meaningless. Now, what I'm trying to figure out on the Board Game Geek one is if that's per half, because you could save. Because then maybe it's accurate, the number that's there. But anyway, so speaking of my kids playing this, they they adored this. Like, like seriously. Like, I, I told you they love Quad Heroes. Sorry, Quad Heroes, you got surpassed by <laughs> Scooby-Doo here. I have never heard either of them laugh so much while playing a game at the table with us. Like, they love the story and the characters, but most of all, that whole fact they could use anyone to do anything. 
Um, every NPC had to be smelled by Scooby. Shaggy attempted to eat or look for food in every corner. Fred figured out how everything worked. Daphne touched and fiddled with everything she could touch. And Velma sat there and investigated every bit of evidence everywhere. There are parts of this game that uh, if kids aren't in the room, just yes, sound I, very different. I, I agree, but we're keeping it G. It's Scooby-Doo. All right. The kids also loved swapping up who was reading. Um, they were, to be honest, arguing over who got to read which book. Um, at first, we considered the whole giving them a book each, but then quickly learned about the thing where not all characters are in the game at all times. So we dropped that. Uh, we did find that each one had their favorite character. Uh, interestingly, Big G took towards Fred and Scooby for Little G. Excellent. Now, what I found most impressive about this game, though, is the level of immersion and exploration compared to like other escape room style games or, or escape room in a box style games or puzzle games. This was just so much more thematic, like it had an overall story and the puzzles were actually linked to the story and made sense with it. It wasn't just, oh, you open the next thing and here's another random puzzle. Like even the keypad puzzles were tied into the theme. They weren't just abstract logic puzzles. Like there, I, I can't give it away, but like it was all tied into this, this mansion, this haunted mansion. There's also a great sense of exploration that almost made it feel like a sandbox. Like, like there was a, a full sense of wonder with having all kinds of features in the room and a mix of character skills that you could combine with those. It felt like we were wandering around and discovering clues. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, Scooby-Doo really is something that is for the whole family, right? There's, there's something in there for everyone from, from veiled references that adults will laugh at mm. to outright comedy that the kids are just going to love oh, yeah. uh, both staps, slapstick and pun based uh, humor. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they have put so much writing into this and given you all those options, you know, that ability to put every character with every clue mm -hmm. means that it, it is a sandbox. Essentially, you know, it's, it's yeah. only limited by the amount of time they were allowed to get to write the new thing. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Now, what I realized last night, so we did save overnight and we played the second part today, is I, this clicked in this morning and I totally missed this last night. Yes, this is basically an escape room in the box, right? It's an exit game. It's an unlock. But what I realized this morning was, you know what it's more like is digital point and click adventures, like like Myst or, or Seventh Guest or the Telltale series for the modern ones. Telltale Batman or Telltale Firefly or all of those. Because it's all about figuring out the right person to use on the right spot with the right combination of objects. Which is basically what you do in all those point and click adventures. Or if you're an old guy like me, the old text adventures of Zork where yeah. you've got to, you know, and, and, and every object you have, you're going to try with everything. So if exactly. you've got someone who can eat, you are going to try and eat every object it lists in that room's inventory. Mm -hmm. Because you never know whether or not, you know, in you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, text adventure, whether or not you're going to need to hold tea and no tea in your hands at the same time. No, exactly. And that's, that's, that's a feel I totally, like, I missed it when we were playing. I'm like, it really is like that type of game, which is really cool. So that's a ton of good, right? So how about some negative points? Well, uh, the biggest one would be that list when you start chapter three, like, please include all of the items you need to act or sorry, chapter two that you need to go into chapter two. That would have saved us a lot of time this afternoon. That would have been a nice one. Uh, the second one, and this is going to be a big one for a lot of players, uh, similar to what we were talking about almost with app based games earlier tonight in today's episode. Um, this is one and done. It's, it's, it's not a very long experience, despite the fact we're saying it's, it's longer than we expected. This is still a single session or two session game. You could finish this entire game in one sitting if you've got a longer game night. There is one story. You're not getting multiple chapters. There's, there's no adventure here. This is not a campaign game that you're going to be playing for weeks. This is sit down and play through a Scooby-Doo episode. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's, the, the price point is licensed price point. So that's the other thing you're getting into, right? So it's for a one and done game, even if you are getting a ton of things, you have to weigh how much you really enjoy that license because you are playing mm. the license markup on what is an exit game in a box. And it's a very good one, yeah. um, but you have to weigh that cost for this particular one and done. So now on a very positive note, 
about this though compared to the exit games is you don't destroy anything while playing this game so once you're done you could technically play again if you wanted or go back and explore the things you didn't but more likely is you could pass this game on to another group or sell it on the secondary market so that is something that i think needs to be taken into in the cost whereas you look at an exit game for 15 bucks it's done like it's garbage there's nothing you do with it whereas this you might be able to recoup half your cost right unless you throw out the box and sort of well yeah that's fine (laughs) i'll just sell those boxes now, as for other negatives, um, the quality is so-so. Um, I wish things were better quality. Like, the books, as I said, are floopy. Like, they're thin and flimsy. They flop around. They're, like, the thinnest possible page count. They are color. Um, the mine are somewhat warped. Um, part of the Scooby-Doo one, actually, some of the ink has worn off on the corners. Mm. The standees really kind of bum me out. Like, like they're almost paper thin. Like, uh, I don't know if you remember years ago playing the paranoia with the miniatures. Like, that's it. Like, these these are a piece of paper folded in half, basically. Like, right. th- there's not much to them. Um, the, the, the room cards are the same thing. Like, these aren't board game boards. These are thin card. Um, what's weird is some of the stuff you unlock in the envelope, envelopes, envelopes, is a uh, punch board. Like, like, actual cardboard and comes pre-punched, which is just weird. Like, why are those punch board, but the rest isn't? And I get it, right? Just what we just talked about. This is a one and done. They had to be very aware of what the game would cost when they were making this. And as it is, this game costs literally double an escape game. And to to bring up the Cosmo games we've reviewed in the past, this is double the cost. By swapping all the cardstock to cardboard, I have a feeling it would have cost more than double an exit game and probably would have scared people off for a one and done game. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. And I think... Again, the real power of this is the license, right? And the fact that they have well, they have they have really gone to great lengths to recreate that feel of a Scooby Doo episode. So, for mm-hmm. anyone who's a real fan of the show, I, I that that really makes it hard to pass up something that has recreated that so nicely. Yeah. Now, overall, I'm pretty sure you can tell uh, this was a pretty glowing review pretty much all the way through. I was very impressed by this game, by Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. The theme and setting are cool, and that made the game family-friendly. The fact I could play uh, a horror mystery game uh, with my youngest was great. And, oh, man, playing with the kids was a hoot. Like, just the stuff they were coming up with and how funny they thought the stuff was, they just loved it. The coded chronicle system is brilliant. I think this is, is is now the gold standard way to do a puzzle game like this. I do look forward to more games in the series. Um, while you can only play it once, I think it was worth it. I think that cost, I'll admit, I didn't spend the cost. We did have to thank the op for this. I would not feel bad having spent what I, the, the MSRP on this game. I also love the fact that I could now pass this game on. Like now that I'm done, I could next time Sean's in town, he can bring it back up to Hamilton and play it with his kids. I, I like that. I didn't have to destroy anything. If you like escape room in a box style games, these puzzle games, pick this one up. Like, especially if you've got kids, if, if you've got a family who will play this, pick this up. But even as adults, this is a solid game. Now, if you've never tried a puzzle like this before, I suggest checking this one out. Like that feeling of exploration and the integration of the theme to me, puts it above all the other escape room in a box experiences. Now, you're going to dedicate more time to it. You're going to dedicate two nights. It's not a throwaway quick experience, but I think it's worth it, and I think this is a good way to check out to see if you enjoy that style of games by having a story wrapped around it to keep you interested. Well, for a more in-depth look at Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.